You will stand trial before the governor and king because you are my father. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So if you're following along in your Bible reading, we're going to go through some of the New Testament books a lot faster than we went through like Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth. So I've made copies and put them over there, and I can get more if I need to. That's Acts through Revelation. So if you want to look at any of those to give you an idea of what's going on and everything, feel free to get one. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that you will never forsake us, that Jesus said that he did not leave us as orphans, but that he would tell the Father to send the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we forget the Spirit is you yourself, Father. He, as Jesus says, will come to be with us, to comfort us, to guide us, to empower us to walk through this world just as Jesus walked through this world, to sanctify us, to tell us more about Jesus by revealing him revealing him who reveals you through your word. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. May you open up our hearts and minds of the Spirit today to tell us the things that you would have us to do and empower us to do them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitle this Wars and Rumors of Wars. You hear about that all the time. Some of you like that stuff a lot. You get hung up on it even. Ah, these end time things. I watched this special about this or that. But do you miss the reason for it? I'll get to that in a little bit. We have sufferings in this world. Because this is not our home. We sinned. We brought this on ourselves. And Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our shepherd, our leader, our teacher, our rabbi, our Lord, suffered. He gave up heaven and suffered and died so that we would follow in his footsteps as his followers and tell others about the glorious home that we have in heaven apart from this place of suffering where there will be no more pain, no more death, where he will wipe every tear from our eye. So we'll get back to the scripture here a little later. If you read this week, you started off reading with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as the Messiah. My, how things change from Palm Sunday to what we call Good Friday. They recognized Jesus as the Messiah the Old Testament had foretold about. They saw all the miracles that he had done. They saw Lazarus walking around who had laid in the tomb four days till he stinketh, is what Scripture says. They were amazed by all the things that Jesus did, except they weren't amazed by his teachings too much that said, if a man wants to be my disciple, he will deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. We don't like hearing that part of the gospel. We want all the things that come with salvation, but we don't want to follow in the footsteps of a Savior who suffered and died for us. After you read about Jesus' triumphal entry into the, to Jerusalem, then Jesus clears the temple is the next thing he does, doesn't he? Because we let things get involved with worshiping the Lord, distract us, get our minds focused on other things. And literally the house of God had become a marketplace. And Jesus cleared the temple and reminded them that it should be a house of prayer. It should be a place that we come together and worship God, pray for Him, seek a relationship with Him. You read from John chapter 12, and I've preached on this uh, passage many times because I think it's so critical to a Christian's understanding that a kernel of wheat must fall to the ground and die. And Jesus was not talking about just Himself. He was talking about you and I. If you want to harvest, you've got to give up your way of thinking, you've got to figure out that your life is not what matters, that His life is what matters, that you're living for the kingdom, that God's will be done and His kingdom come. So in John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus replied, Now the time has come 
for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels. And then he explains it for us. A plentiful harvest of new lives. Jesus has already said that it was time for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. Not that He was ascending to heaven or anything else, but that He was going to die. That was what was going to bring Him glory. That He was willing to lay down His life to save a friend. Anyone who would believe that He was who He said He is and believe in His message. So he says, I tell you the truth in verse 24. That's the verily, verily in some versions. Or listen up. I want you to hear this. Don't miss this point. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But with that death comes life. Life that you have nothing to do with is planted in the ground and the power is already there in the seed. You just have to be willing to die. Pretty simple, but very hard, isn't it? We looked at all the Old Testament and all the times that the, the Israelites could not keep the law, the standard that God had. That standard hasn't changed. He wants His people to be holy, for He is holy. He demands it. But yet we can't do it. We can't keep the law. We are pitiful. We are naked, we are blind, as Scripture says. And we will pay the penalty for our sins. But if we're willing to die, to be born again by the power of the Spirit that gives us life, that will reveal the Scripture to us, that will reveal Jesus to us, that will give us the power to live, that as we die will give the power to create a harvest through us of new lives then we'll see the glory that Jesus entered into with His death and we will raise up with Him in resurrection. Verse 25, those who love their life. I, I like my life, right? I love my life. Those who love their life in this world, here and now, will lose their life. Because they'll realize that this isn't what it's all about. If I really value my life, if I really love others, if I love my family, if I want the better things and I'll die to my sinful nature in this world, my wants, needs, and desires so that I can live for Christ. He goes on to say, those who care nothing for their life in this world, they don't worry about the things of this world. It means nothing because they know their Heavenly Father will take care of them already. Those who care care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. What a promise. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Doesn't say might follow me. Doesn't say should follow me. It says they must follow me. Jesus has just said that he is going to die so that there can be a harvest. We must follow him in that sacrificial life to save others. <clears throat> Why? Because my servants must be where I am. Now that passage could stop right there, but that's not the end of that verse because there's always so many promises. Oh, it's so wonderful when you read through God's Word. And see, not only does He say, if you obey me, He says, if you obey me, I'll do this for you. <laughs> he doesn't have to, but He does because what good father doesn't want to give gifts to their child? So Jesus goes on to say, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Honor, give them weight, value. He will honor them for doing what they should have done in the first place. That's so cool. What a God that we serve that would love us enough to honor us for doing what He commanded in the first place. A kernel of wheat must die if there's going to be an, a harvest. If you want to be Jesus' disciple, if you believe in Him, in His name, in His message, then you will follow Him even to death. Why not? The Son of God gave His life to spare you. If you keep reading John 12, verse 27, 
It says, Now my soul is deeply troubled because Jesus was a man. He faced all the temptations, all the suffering that we face. Don't let you think that it's any different. He was the God-man. He feared what he would go through, but he didn't fear it more than he feared God in a holy, reverent fear. Don't get me wrong in my terminology. His soul was deeply troubled. Think about that. Whatever it is that you're facing in your life that you faced before, that you faced later, whether it's death, whether it's cancer, whether it's pain, suffering, whatever it is, he was deeply troubled in his soul. Not just his heart, but in everything that had to do with his being as a human being. Should I pray? Should this be my prayer? Father, save me from this hour? It's naturally what we would want to do because we don't want to go through that pain and suffering. But when we see the overall good, why would we not? So if you really believe Jesus' words and if you plant yourself in the ground because you're willing to die so that your family will live, isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it to know that your children your, your spouse, your mother, your father, your in-laws, your friends, even your enemies will be in heaven because you were willing to lay down your life for them as Jesus laid down His life for you? That's what the Scripture says. But this is the very reason I came, and if you follow Him, it should be the reason that you follow Him. Father, bring glory to Your name. Then there's that voice from heaven, and Jesus says, that voice from heaven was not... For my benefit, it was for yours. Some thought it was thunder. Some thought it was God's voice. But will you hear and obey? God brings glory to Himself and glory to you. We just read that earlier. By your obedient following after Jesus, your Savior and Lord. If we drop down to verse 47, Jesus says, I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me. Uh-oh, there's the, there's the criteria. Hear and you must obey, which means you must follow. And Jesus says, I won't judge you if you don't do that. I won't judge you if you listen to me and you don't obey me. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. Verse 48, but all who do reject me and my message. Don't forget that because so many people say, I believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And then James has to write his letter to the church that says, I don't believe you, just like Jesus said in John chapter 2, because your actions don't prove what you say you believe. All who reject me and my message will be judged. When? On the day of judgment. And they will be judged by what standard? By the truth that I have spoken. Every last word that Jesus speaks. So we can't pick and choose which ones we like and which ones we don't like. They're all His message. And all re who reject Jesus and His message will be judged on the day when He returns. Because we do belong to one kingdom or the other. And Jesus will come to claim those who have given their allegiance to His kingdom. <clears throat> Verse 49, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me, just like we get Jesus' commands, to say and how to say it. And I know His commands lead to eternal life. You can be sure of that. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Now reading that, is it okay to listen and not obey? <laughs> nope. Pretty clear, right? And that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Hear, O hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one. You must follow after Him. You must obey all these decrees. And if you do, there will be blessings. Choose this day whom you will serve. We are to follow after Jesus and His message. And His commands... Do lead, period. Not might lead, but do lead to eternal life. If there is eternal life, there has to be an opposite, right? 
eternal death. The choice is yours. Blessings or cursings. You can't serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. And that, that scripture always bothers me. Because <laughs> I don't want to think that I ever hate Jesus when I'm not obeying Him. But that's what the scripture says, doesn't it? I will love one or hate the other. Can I love one without hating another? That's not what Scripture says. Because, see, I'll, I'll lose my passion, my heart's desire, if I let those weeds get in and choke out the harvest that I was supposed to produce with my life. So in our reading, we read a parable about a great feast. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by this story. We find it in Matthew 22. And I'm going to start in verse 8. I'm not going to read it all because you should have read it. I'm just going to give you some highlights. Verse 8, He said to the, His servants, The wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now this is supposed to make us think ahead of the kingdom of heaven which will be eternal. And Jesus is saying there's some guests that were invited that God says they're not worthy of this honor. Well, let's read on and see what happens. It says, Now go on to the street corners and invite everyone you see, because the gospel will be available to all men. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. Let me read that one again. Good and bad alike. That means I don't deserve grace any more than anybody else. <laughs> but God gives it freely to all those who will. <laughs> Nobody's done anything too bad. And no one's done anything good enough. Good and bad alike. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. <clears throat> Verse 11. But. And whenever you see that but, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's the complete opposite. Oh, some things are so great when you see that but, other things aren't. Okay? This one's not too great. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Now, I don't know what you're thinking here, like, what wedding clothes. How do I get wedding clothes? Just think about it. It's pretty simple. We're to put on the robe of righteousness which comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. If we're following in that, we're clothed with His righteousness. Why would you put on His clothes and not follow in His footsteps? Okay? He wasn't wearing the proper clothes. And the, the <clears throat> host says, friend he, is, friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? So it was obvious that he didn't do that. And the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness. Wait a minute. Why, why couldn't he just let him in? Because the only way to get in is to be invited by Jesus and then put on his righteousness. Not say, I'm invited, I'm coming. You've got to put on His righteousness. You've got to seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added unto you. You've got to be a doer and not just a hearer. Uh-oh, there's more to this verse. Where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I told you that last time as you read this. Each time you see weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's not because of the destination. It's because the person thought his destination was not there. He thought his destination was the kingdom of heaven, that he had eternal life with God forever and ever and ever. But on that day, he found out differently. Man, I don't know about you, but that just breaks me to the core because I know there are many, my scriptures say it again, that say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty miracles in your name? But he says, depart from me, I don't know you. What a terrible thing to think you have your, 
invitation in your pocket your whole time, but you didn't love God enough that you followed after His Son, Jesus. You can't serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other. So who do you love? Do you love Jesus with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> well, you read about that greatest command that I told you to. You read that in the scriptures this week. You know it by heart. <laughs> but do you live it by your heart? All of it. We have the examples there where the, where the religious leaders could quote it, <laughs> but did they live it? In Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now he's quoting from Deuteronomy here, and Jesus puts in mind because it's the day and age we live in of reasoning, that we think our reasoning, we're so smart and intellectual, and our reasoning can save us. And that's why he said to repent, to change your way of thinking when he first came. That's why John said it too. Because if you can't wrap your mind around this, you're never going to get your heart around this. He hit every aspect of our being. Will you love the Lord with all of it? Because see, the mind was the thing that kept people from Jesus then. Guess what? It's still the thing that keeps them from them today. Oh, I can't see how God would send His Son, and I, yeah, that didn't really happen, and surely there can't be a hell, and surely there'll be a second chance. No, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Verse 31, the second is equally important. Don't stop there. Love your neighbor as your Self. Yep, I love myself. I like good things for myself. I want life eternal. Why would I not want it for them? No other commandment is greater than these. Now, if you notice, it said commandment, not commandments. What do you think that is? Here's what I think. Jesus was addressing that man. He was addressing a crowd. He was addressing all who had ears who would hear and all those who had ears who would hear and obey. And he said commandment because it is one. If you love the Lord your God, you will love others because Jesus is the embodiment of all of that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we can't know love if the Father wouldn't, didn't love us first. And Jesus is giving this command to love the Lord your God with everything and to love your neighbor as yourself. In Mark chapter 12, verse 32, the teacher of the religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love Him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength, to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Look at the guy's answer. He addressed everything Jesus said, even the reasoning part. He addressed that it was more important than anything, any works of righteousness that you could do, any keeping of the law, that you didn't have understanding of the law if you didn't love. You didn't even understand what it meant. But did he do that? We don't know. But we do know what Jesus' answer is. Very next verse. Realizing how much the man understood. I can get my mind right. Will it affect this? 
Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not there yet. Because with all this understanding that has come to you, you've got to put it into your heart and apply it to action. You're so close. But close is only good in hand grenades and horseshoes, right? That's what the saying is. And what? Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. It's not okay for the kingdom of heaven. If you don't put on Jesus' righteousness, you won't enter into the great banquet. <clears throat> Jesus has a lot of commands, frankly, right? <laughs> Tough commands. Commands that surely He couldn't expect us to follow all of these, right? But He does. Even the one that says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And He knows these commands are impossible for you. That's why He patterned His life and showed us the way, the truth, and the life, and then sent the Holy Spirit back to empower us to live that. Yes, He expects that standard. And it's a standard that we expect to have in heaven, is it not? So why would we not want to sanctify ourselves through and through with the Spirit and the Word so that we are like Jesus Christ in this world? so that we do die so that a harvest is reaped. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 21, we read about a widow's offering. It says, while Jesus, in verse 1, While Jesus was in the temple, He watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. They were giving. They were rich. Nothing wrong with that. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. So Jesus said, I tell you the truth, verily, verily, listen up. The poor widow has given more than all of the rest of them. Because see, he doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your time or your talent. He just wants you. He wants your heart. He wants you to love as he loved and gave himself. She's given more than the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything. She loves the Lord with all, even her last two cent, literally. Now, application of that, you're all rich, very rich. We sometimes don't realize it when we look at this world where we live right here and now. But when you look at the world as a whole, you're elite. The freedoms you have, the money you have, the health care you have, even though you want to complain about it and everything else, <laughs> the freedom that we have in this government, like, even though we want to complain about that, you are rich. So are you giving a tiny part out of your surplus? Or are you, as we have a parable about a rich fool, are you giving out of the abundance that God has given you? She gave the last two cents she had to live on. How much are you giving to God because He has blessed you so richly? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot pledge allegiance to two kings. You will love one and hate the other. Now process that, because like I said, I have a tough one with that verse. I have the tough with the contrast of the hate. But any time that I don't see the fruits of the Spirit, when I'm selfish and I think of myself and I want my own way, I'm serving another master. And that means I'm hating the one who gave his life for me. And I like thinking about it that way because then it brings me to my knees. It makes me ask for forgiveness. It makes me ask that He will sanctify me through and through. That He'll forgive me for my sins and bring about the fruits of the Spirit so that I think less of my life and more of His kingdom and telling others the way. And the more that I see the promises and I do see them in reality when I do this, I do see them. Maybe not as much as I want to, but, but you get those nuggets that when you give up of yourself that you see those fruits starting to bud. 
And God promises that His Word won't come back void. You've got all of these promises. The Scripture is clear that where our heart is, where our passion is, that's where we'll focus our time and effort. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Mike is preaching next week. Boy, if you're reading along, he gets the passion of the Christ. He gets Peter's denial and reinstatement. He gets the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He gets the ascension. He gets the coming of the Holy Spirit and the starting of the first church. Wow, not to put that all on you. <laughs> wow. And what happens when we see the birth of the church? We see people selling everything they have because they don't care about it anymore so that they can love their neighbor as themselves. We see this great commandment that Jesus gave coming to life by the power of the Spirit. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Spirit that was involved in the birth of the church is still the same Spirit that is in this church today. The same Spirit that lives inside of you that you are a priest and together we are a royal priesthood. So here's the question again. What or who do you love? You will love one and you will hate the other. I know I'm saying this a lot, but I'm saying it so it sinks in because we're kind of thick-skulled. <laughs> I have to hear it too. I'm not just saying it to you. Love one and hate the other. Wow, oh, and then there's that commandment to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you remember the young rich man we read about? I mean, he knew it all, and he came up to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, You know what you've got to do? You've got to keep the law. And it just blows me away that that guy says, I've done that since I was a child. I've done that since I had the reasoning to understand that I was supposed to do it. And Jesus did not argue with him. He just said to put your money where your mouth is. Since you've done all that, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have so you won't put your trust in it anymore. So you won't love it anymore so that you can understand about God's love for you and nothing will hinder you from loving me with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. He had kept all the commandments, but he lacked one thing. Give up everything else for Jesus. In Luke 21, <clears throat> continuing on verse 9, Jesus says, And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. It's been a long time, hasn't it? And we continue to see things, and we're like, oh, surely it's coming soon. Then he added, Nation will go to war against nation. Yep. Kingdom against kingdom. Yep. There will be great earthquakes. Yep. And there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. Some of you watch that news box all day long listening to all these things. It's all over the place. And you sit there and say, oh yeah, Jesus has got to be coming soon. Jesus has got to be coming soon. But what do you do with that? Let's read on. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. And we're not really even persecuted much here. So we have more... I won't say this word yet. I'll wait... You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons. You will stand trial before kings and governors. I hadn't had that done that much yet, right? Not at all, really. Because you're my followers. Okay, so I need to question myself. Am I a follower? Well, it's nothing wrong with being rich again. He's given me rich so that I can be rich. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But why do all these terrible things have to happen? Merle, you read it. Did you catch it? The last verse. This will be your opportunity.
to tell them about me. All these times when we want to say, oh Lord, take this suffering away from me. When Scripture's clear, it's so that you have an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. Polly told me the other day when I went to visit her, she's in one room and across the hall is Marna, Mara, and they talked about Jesus. Both of them are in the hospital suffering. What brought them together to talk about Jesus? They're suffering. I talked to Barb, and Barb said that it just impressed her so much that most of the people there talked about Jesus and even prayed with her. But she's there because of her suffering. Do you look for opportunities in your suffering? But if you're not suffering, are you looking for opportunities in your riches? Don't miss that chance. Because we have been blessed to be so rich and out of that we shouldn't be worried about building storehouses up for our own grain. We should be planting seed. The rich fool's life was required that night because he didn't see that. <clears throat> Look for every opportunity to tell others. <clears throat> bad things will happen. They happen to good people. They happen to bad people. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Next verse. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Now again, if you're not suffering, if you're living in a time of excess and riches, don't you think he'll give you the words to say then too? But so many of God's children are afraid to go talk to others because they don't know what words to say. If He'll give you the words in persecution and suffering, He'll give you the words in your happiness and joy on the mountaintop. Think about it. You have more words to say then. Have you heard about all these good things happening? You have more to say when things are good than they are bad. Just naturally, let alone God will give you the wisdom and the words to say. Verse 15, For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair on your head will perish. Now if that's for the suffering, it doesn't mean that day because some of them were killed. That means for eternity you have nothing to worry about. Not even one single hair and what about praising Him in the good times? Verse 19, By standing firm you will win your souls. Clearly, Christians have a mission. Clearly, they're supposed to follow Jesus, not just believe in Jesus. Mark 13 and Matthew 24 give the same accounts. In Mark 13, you'll find it starting in verse 9. When these things begin to happen, watch out. You'll be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You'll stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Mark doesn't miss that point. For the good news must be preached to all nations. That started with a prepositional phrase. The gospel must be preached. You have a privilege to do it. And these things that are happening all over the world are still happening because the gospel hasn't been preached everywhere yet. We need to continue to tell others, ushering Jesus' return. This opportunity and blessing that we have. This calling that He has given us to be ministers of reconciliation. Verse 11, But when you're arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at the time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Clearly that we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And children will be, rebel against parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. That promise again. In Matthew, starting in verse 12 of chapter 24... Sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold. 
Matthew's put a new aspect in that, and boy, we see that, even in the churches in this country. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom, don't forget that this is a kingdom ministry we're doing, will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, then the end will come. Verse 37, When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. Don't concentrate on the evil things that were in Noah's day. That's not what he's saying here. He was saying there's weddings and parties, the same thing that you should be longing for in heaven, this great wedding banquet or feast. But see, the difference is people got so caught up in these feasts and banquets, the things of this world, that they missed their calling and they missed the day the rains came and swept them all away. So Jesus is saying this, don't you dare miss the time that I will return because you've let yourself get caught up in the things of this world. Yeah, they're great, and I gave them to you. But use them to bring me glory and honor and look for the opportunity to tell others about me. Verse 39, people didn't realize what was going on until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Don't miss these opportunities. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two one will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. What's that saying? That's saying standing right beside of me, whether it's the workplace or wherever it's at, I have a mission opportunity. Because if two are taken, and I am one of them, if I am, if I believe in Jesus Christ, if I put my faith and trust in Him, then there's a good chance that the person sitting beside of me won't be there. So I need to share with them. I need to look for every opportunity because that day will come and then it's too late. You have an opportunity to share everywhere you go in everything you do, in blessings and in suffering. In Matthew 10 and Matthew 16, these are words we've already read, but they'll reinforce what I'm saying here. This part about the mission that the disciples agree to take on. In Matthew 10, verse 37, If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Did you get a pattern there? I didn't repeat all that. I read Scripture three times. Jesus repeated it to the crowd that day because they're thick-skulled just like I'm thick-skulled. Then he said this, If you cling to your life, the things you think important now, and you keep on living for yourself, you will lose it. But, here's the good but, if you give up your life for me, you will find it. These are words that are already ringing in the, in the people that are listening to Jesus' words when he tells them about the great banquet in heaven. In Matthew 16, he said this in verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone, when any one of you wants to be my follower, if you're going to believe in me and come follow after me, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you're trying to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Which I don't think any of us will, but putting the bar up there, all these things we live for, if we get all of them, what will it benefit you when you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with His angels in the glory of His Father and will judge all people according to their faith. Are you on the right verse? 27. No, nope, doesn't say faith, does it? According to their deeds. No, I don't need deeds to be saved. But if I am saved, if I do believe, then I will deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. In Awana, <clears throat> kind of different than, where's Joy? She must be in the nursery. Kind of different than what youth group was years ago. 
Youth group, I had some rowdy kids. We'll just put it that way. They were seeking Jesus. They didn't know it, some, a lot of them. But they heard the gospel message over and over. Now I've got church kids seeking Jesus. Problem's the same. That's why I wish I could see Joy's face because she and I were talking about it the other day. She said, whenever, y'all, you can be talking about whatever, but when you start really getting serious talking about Jesus, then it goes all over the place. There's so many distractions, so many things. And I told her, I said, that's because we fight a spiritual battle, Joy. I, and she says, I see that. Because we're fighting for one master our allegiance to him or the other. It doesn't matter how much you're churched or anything else. It matters about your love for God and then your love for others. The greatest commandment. And we need to teach our kids so there will be a harvest. I struggle with the churched kids getting them to focus on Jesus trying to get them to read their Bible, trying to see the importance of it. And I'll I'll say this from experience rather than pointing fingers anywhere. It's probably because I hadn't spent enough time training them up, writing it on the doorposts of my house, talking about it when I get up so that they see the importance of it. Please, please see every opportunity that you have to tell others, especially your family, about Jesus Christ. What time is it? Okay, I got time. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus gives a parable of ten bridesmaids, then a parable of three servants, then something else. I'm going to read through it. Starting with verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like... Okay, you got the stage set? Ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. We got one standing in the field, one taking the other left. Okay? The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps. They've been invited to this wedding. Okay? But they didn't take enough oil for their lamps. Oil is equated to the Holy Spirit, it's equated to the light they give off. I'm just going to read most of it. Okay? Otherwise, I'll be here all day. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil, to put in a little extra effort. When the bridegroom was delayed, which it's been a long time, right? We think Jesus is coming. We see the wars and rumors of war. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. No condemnation there. There's none in this parable about that. At midnight, (laughs) when I'm the most tired, least expecting... They were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because your lamps are going out. You might think that this was selfish of them or whatever, but they can't even give them the oil if they wanted to. Okay? But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy oil... The bridegroom came. So don't get focused on all that. Get focused on ten bridesmaids invited to the wedding feast. Five of them were wise by bringing along extra oil, extra effort. Five of them were foolish. They all fell asleep, okay? But then there's the call. And those, verse 10, when they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready... Boy, you can tie that to Jesus' scriptures all over. To be ready, to be dressed and serving, to realize your mission, to take up your cross, which means I've got to deny myself first, and that means then I've got to follow, not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Now these five foolish ones, they have their wedding invitation. They have their clothes, maybe. Okay? Verse 11. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord. Does that sound familiar? Open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. 
So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Be ready. Jesus Christ will return. He has given you an invitation. Jesus doesn't stop there. Then he gives a parable right back to back of it, of the three servants. Again, the kingdom of heaven, second story, same topic. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. It's been a long time. I said that before. He called together his servants and he entrusted them with his money while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their ability. So don't be jealous if somebody has more of this than you do in the, for the kingdom and everything. God gives them according to what he sees fit. The Spirit gives gifts as he sees according. Okay? Then he left on his trip. Verse 16, The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Okay? Proportionally, they've done the same thing. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. He did nothing with what was entrusted to him. He kept it safe, but he didn't do anything with it. Okay? After a long time, their master did return from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in hand handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you have given me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now, the NLT in verse 21 says the master was full of praise. NLT put that in there. Verse 21 and 23, and there's nothing wrong with that. We won't chase that. Verse 21 and 23 are identical identical rewards for the people who did something with it. doesn't matter what harvest was brought about, to some 50, to some 100, you know, whatever. It was that they did something with what they were given, and they got, well done, my good and faithful servant. Okay? <clears throat> then the servant with one bag of silver came in and said, Master, still his master, right? I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. I was afraid to go witness to my neighbor down the street because I didn't know the words to say, and, you know, I was afraid he'd come out with a shotgun, and, and I was afraid to witness to the person in the hospital because I was really feeling bad and blah, blah, blah. And if you went to visit Rose, she was hitting that whatever button a lot. She sent me texts, I love you, um, that I didn't know what she said. <laughs> but that's okay. That medicine is for a reason, and I'm glad she's here and recovering. All these reasons and excuses that you have, okay? Verse 25, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags. Okay. We'll address that in another sermon. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. This reward is building up treasures in heaven. But for those who do nothing, who say, I'm fine with what I believe, but do nothing with it, who are afraid to die to reap a harvest, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth because they never, ever thought they would go there. 
Then you have what the NLT says is the final judgment. This is tying that together. But when the Son of Man does come in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered in His presence and He will separate the people as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones, clothed with Jesus' righteousness, will reply, Lord, when did we do this? Do. They did these things because they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul so that they loved others and did things for them. Their light shined before others so that they could see God's glory and give Him praise and honor and be drawn into the kingdom. <clears throat> these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away from, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire. It was never prepared for you. It was prepared for the devil and his demons. But it's still your destination. Why? There's a prepositional phrase here. Not because you didn't believe, not because you didn't get an invitation, but for I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply the same thing. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, listen up, verily, verily, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, when your actions didn't prove your belief. You were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now, we've covered a lot this week. Mike, you got a lot on your shoulders next week. But don't miss Jesus' message. It's not just John 3.16. It's, it's not just believe and be saved. That's one verse out of His message. And that's even debatable whether it's a word written in black or words written in red. Because it doesn't say Jesus said right before it. There's so much to Jesus' message about following Him. About doing and it's a problem in the church that's been and it always will be because we fight a spiritual battle. While you'll go into right after Acts, you'll go into James because of the letter he had to write to the church. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't even believe Jesus himself because he's his brother, but then believed and proclaimed and told others, he said, if you really believe, you will do. Show me your faith by your actions. So my plea, my prayer is that your faith will be a faith of action, a faith that speaks to your children, a faith that looks for every opportunity in the good times and the bad times to tell others about Jesus Christ until He returns. Don't let Him come when you least expect it. Be ready, dressed, and serving, giving out of the abundance that He has given to you. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for Jesus' words. We thank you that he was willing to give up heaven, that he was willing to lay down his life when he could have cried out to you to take the cup from him, cry out to a legion of angels to come and take him off the cross and destroy those who were persecuting. But he didn't because instead he wanted your will to be done and your kingdom come. Lord, give us the boldness as the first church prayed for when they saw their 
leaders persecuted. They didn't pr pray for the persecution at the end. They prayed for boldness to preach the gospel message. Help us not to become complacent in this time when we're not suffering, but to look at it as more opportunity to tell others of Jesus Christ, to live a life of worth, to long for the day when Jesus returns and says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen.